Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello, uh, my name is John David from Clyde and Kerr. I'm a partner in the uh, specialty insurance risk and reinsurance team, a member of the political risk and trade credit group. I'm delighted that you've all been able to make it this morning for what is a further seminar in the series that Menas and Associates have been putting on for us and which we're delighted to host. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about uh, Clyde & Co, very, very quickly, just to give you a, a thumbnail sketch, we're about 1,400 lawyers and fee earners. We operate across the world in 37 offices. I think of particular relevance to today, we have a very strong presence. We're the largest presence uh, of any, inter any international law firm uh, in the Middle East. We've been there for about 30 years, uh, which gives us a great network of uh, contacts in uh, business and government, which, from my own experience, is invaluable, having people on the ground who know what they're doing. Um, as you can see, our core strengths that we, we, we focus on around the world, and particularly in the Middle East, international trade, infrastructure, aviation, insurance, energy, shipping, and transportation. Um, I would say that, uh, from my own experience, um, having people on the ground is the most important thing with experience uh, of the local customs and the way that business uh, works. And I've certainly had cases where things have gone horribly wrong for English lawyers who are treading in areas that they don't know much about. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Charles Gurdon of Menas Associates. And Charles uh, is going to tell you something about the work that they do and is going to introduce you to today's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, apologies for my voice. Uh, it hasn't recovered since last year. Um, we're small but perfectly formed um, in terms of this audience. Um, now, it obviously appears to some that borders aren't necessarily important, but they obviously are. And I'm going to try and demonstrate that a little bit, and then Richard will talk. Um, first of all, a little bit about me as associates. Um, Minas actually began uh, working on international border disputes about 13 years ago when we were asked to work with um, or for the Libyans when they were involved in the dispute with Tunisia. We subsequently worked on um, perhaps seven or eight other disputes of the ICJ and arbitration cases before branching out to work mainly for oil companies uh, on political risk issues. But border issues still come back and are still of importance. Um, if one thinks about it, I mean, in the last, um, only in the last uh, few weeks, the Iraqi parliament has criticized the uh, government over the fact that they are not uh, developing the fields which are jointly held with Iran. And we've worked on projects in the last uh, six months on places as diverse as Lake Malawi, um, <coughs> and the Philippines uh, and elsewhere. And oil companies need, um, uh, they, need to, they need to have certainty. At the same time, border issues have tremendous domestic importance. Um, and this was demonstrated in some ways by the uh, Egypt-Israel dispute over the hotel at Tarma. We're talking about a building which was perhaps no bigger than this one. <coughs> And yet, Egypt and Israel disputing that, um, uh, disputing that area, that tiny area, for many years. And in the end, although Egypt won, it then paid Israel compensation for the hotel. And so it won, but then paid for a tiny piece of land. And equally, uh, other disputes, the same sort of things have happened. And so borders have tremendous emotive importance. And today I'm delighted that we have Richard Schofield as our speaker. Richard um, was originally at the School of Oriental and African Studies where Minas was started. And he, in fact, he did his uh, MA on the Shatel Arab Waterway, the dispute between um, Iraq and Iran. He subsequently went on to head the um, Geopolitics and International Boundary uh, Unit at SOAS before that moved together with the geography, together with the geography geography department at um, SOAS moved to King's. And he's there now, and he teaches um, an MA in, in territoriality, 
and international. Well, we used to call it international boundaries. We didn't get any students, so we called it <laughs> geopolitics, territory, and security, and we got loads. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so I'm delighted that Richard will now be talking for about half an hour to 25 minutes on the Gulf, and we can also widen it out in questions to other areas, um, perhaps as well, at least in the uh, concept of border disputes in other areas. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, Charles. I also apologise uh, for breaking my tooth, my crown off, eating a cheese sandwich the other evening. Uh, I, had a, I had a lecture uh, to my students uh, just after it happened yesterday morning. And they had this gormless guy, toothless guy, grinning at them. So <laughs> the pattern's being repeated this morning, so I apologize. <coughs> um, I suppose the first thing you'd have to say about uh, boundary disputes in this region, or if we just go and look at the state of the map, is that, you know, we're in a context, in many ways, of practicalities, uh, where the, the states of the region have inherited... Uh, a bit of a mess in certain areas, particularly the southwestern corner of the Gulf between the United Arab Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia. The political map, the offshore political map, is a bit messy, and uh, there's certain things which aren't terribly con convenient. The most of the maritime boundary agreements which were signed in this part of the world were in the late 60s, so they were rather primitive in terms of the datum that they used. For instance, the charts that they mentioned. Uh, on all the agreements uh, from, say, the mid-60s to the mid-70s uh, weren't the result of modern sort of survey sort of techniques and technologies. They're a whole mixture of stuff. Uh, so as a result today, and a few of you will know, it drives quite a few of the oil companies crazy, that if you're given coordinates for an oil, uh, oil concession in the middle of the Gulf, you can't actually be sure uh, because of the nature of the agreements and the datum that went into them, you can't actually be sure where it is precisely in the water. And uh, so there's been all sorts of suggestions that at some point, basically, you, you put a great big annex and all the agreements that have been uh, reached in this agreement, and you refer them to modern digital datum sets. So <coughs> a lot of technical problems, um, but uh, I think well, there are a few things to talk about, obviously, or else I wouldn't try and give a talk. Um, but I'm always going to, I'm a geographer, but I'm also a frustrated historian. So um, I would say that you've always got to know to some degree uh, the historical dynamic of disputes. Because, you know, whether they're um, solved or alive, they tend to come back cyclically when you get a coincidence of certain factors and pressures and whatever. So um, there's lots of themes which, you know, you might read about in the headlines and you think, wow, progress. And you realize those ideas and those reports have been around <coughs> for decades, for yonks. For instance, Kuwait and Iran uh, have announced, they announced in 1970 that a maritime boundary agreement was imminent. They've been doing it every two years since 1970, <laughs> saying that a maritime boundary is imminent. And what did we hear in uh, December? We heard that there was a deal. Um, there was a deal over the lower Gulf lines, and, uh, and it was unclear what it was. And many people thought, oh yeah, oh yeah, but the, the reports wouldn't really go away. Uh, they kept coming in. Um, and I've talked to a few people about this, and there may be something in it, uh, there may <coughs> not be. But from what I, I could sort of gather, um, and from what people have said in both Oman and Iran, um, there may have been a meeting uh, which involved Iranian, UAE officials, and it may have been staged in Muscat. I say I qualify everything. Uh, and it may have resulted in the following sort of deal. The possibility of a pipeline, an oil pipeline, from the Iranian side um, to... Have I got a mouse here? It's an electronic one, isn't it? No, it's not in cassette, no. Why not the mouse? I'll point now. Um, some sort of oil pipeline going to the western side of the Mazandan Peninsula, some sort of right to put a facility there, and some sort of possible uh, right to have an output of that facility in the Gulf of Oman. Um, in return for lease 
lease conditions uh, for the United Arab Emirates over the Tum Islands, obviously islands which are claimed uh, by the United Arab Emirates, which were possessed by them until they were seized the day before Britain left the region of protecting power in 1971. Um, now, you know, I don't think there's been any formal confirmation that there is a deal, and if there is a deal in principle, um, will it ever be enacted? Probably not. Um, but something happened. It, it, there have been too many reports of something happening to dismiss it utterly and completely. Uh, but obviously until we see A, the text of any agreement, and B, uh, the results of any agreement in terms of it, it may just remain a pipe dream. But again, the sort of headlines that come up every so often. Uh, you know, but if you look back in the history of this dispute, we've had all sorts of deals and packages announced over the years. If we went back to the interwar years between Iran and Britain, you know, they often said, uh, let's have a package swap of islands. You know, we'll have Abu Musa for the crucial coast. Maybe under certain conditions, we, there might be a way whereby the Tums could be, or one or two of them, Siri was in the mix as well. There might be a, a scheme whereby we could trade off and, you know, uh, but they never got it together, the Iranians or the Brits. And then, of course, between 1968 and 71, the Shah was looking for a, a way to get rid of the claim to the uh, to Bahrain, which was maintained in name only. It was a purely a nominal claim. He was looking for a way to get rid of that. And many people often thought that the, the quid pro quo here was a green light from Britain to move on the lower Gulf Islands when Britain left the Gulf. So all these sort of, you know, sort of package deals uh, have always been mentioned in connection with the Lower Gulf Islands. Uh, but, and there was never any compelling evidence, obviously, that there was a Bahrain, a Lower Gulf Islands trade-off. But it's interesting, again, that if you just looked at that headline, uh, here again is another deal uh, that involves the islands. It's much more blurry than all the others in many, many ways. But, you know, it could well amount to absolutely nothing, but it might amount to something. But we've had lots of deals reported before, and they haven't always come to very much. Um, I, I promised uh, Charles I wouldn't delve too deeply into history here. Um, but basically what I'm going to look at in the next half hour or so is is to suggest that where it comes to maritime boundaries in an area that is often painted in terms of uh, being a source of conflict, the Persian Gulf, there's been an awful lot of innovation in the way states have combined, have uh, cooperated together to get access to uh, disputed resources of oil and gas. And we'll look at a few of those, going right back to 1958 <coughs> in fact. Uh, so never underplay the potentialities for cooperation over resources where both states can benefit. Uh, you know, sometimes they do cooperate. And of course, in, in recent memory, during the Iran-Iraq war, the only thing perhaps they did cooperate over, the states of the region, was uh, to stop the threat of oil slicks over the desalination uh, sort of plants on the western side of the Gulf. So they can cooperate when they need to, and particularly over resources. But we will look at one or two questions as well. We'll look at the Northern Gulf, because it's still a bit of a mess in terms of access and communication, with a mismatch of territorial waters. We've still some practical questions about the Shat al Arab boundary, where it meets the Gulf, uh, which channel is which channel. Uh, the one that was uh, specified as the boundary back in 75, or the degree to which the channel has moved by physical change in the period since. There's problems of access, again, between Iraq and Kuwait, particularly in light of the uh, big efforts to regenerate the Ramela and Zubair fields in the south. Central Gulf waters, well, I just wanted an excuse to show some of those marvelous fabricated maps that were, okay, were part of that particular case uh, between Bahrain and Qatar, where Qatar decided there wasn't enough evidence uh, around to support the arguments it wanted to make. So it found some evidence, <laughs> and uh, we'll have a look at some of the uh, uh, maps they're quite amusing, actually. Um, and then we'll, we'll, look, uh, we'll, we'll end up by looking at the southwestern Gulf, because as I say, there's a number of really untidy questions there 
that relate back to the 1974 treaty between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And it was two states that nearly came to blow in this region, in, in the Gulf waters, uh, admittedly not very seriously and with no huge uh, threat of, of harm. It was the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia in uh, March 2010 where one small vessel sh uh, fired a warning shot uh, over the bows of another. Uh, again, it, it shows that there, there, are, there are issues there. As I said, I promised Charles I wouldn't go too historical, but I will go back to one map. It would have been useful if I put the colour map of this and I put the black and white one in. Uh, I'm reminded of that immortal snooker commentary where, for those of you watching black and white, the green is behind the brown. Uh, but what did this show? It, what this shows is, is something about maps, and I'll get on to say something about maps in the rest of the um, talk, because states are using maps in creative ways. Uh, <coughs> they have been doing in the last, in a more subtle form of conduct of disputes, and it relates to this, this part of the world. This was the map, uh, a sheet in the map, that was given by the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Salisbury, to the Shah of Iran. It's a war office map, and it was presented in eight sheets in the 1880s. And it was meant to show the boundary that British India wanted with Persia, and that was its real focus. Around this time, of course, the lower Gulf Islands, uh, the, we had the origins of a dispute, if you like, uh, between uh, what was then Persia and the Trucial Coast and the Khawasim, the, the ruling families of Sharjah and Ras al um, at, at the time when Britain was trying to defend those ruling families to these islands, uh, this map was produced and Lord Salisbury flagged it as geographically authoritative and he said, this is the information I believe your uh, majesty has been hoping for. And of course it showed all the islands in the Gulf in red, uh, <coughs> in Persian colours. And uh, I think there was a comment shortly after that by Lord Salisbury, please note that we won't give maps as diplomatic gifts in the future. Yeah. Looking at the... Um, map here, and looking how states have been creative over the years, uh, of course, um, Britain as colonial power was responsible for some of this innovation, but not all of it. Um, the agreement between Bahrain and uh, Saudi Arabia in 1958 introduced one of the earliest joint development zones ever seen uh, around the world, and has been massively influential. The shoal here, the Busafa shoal, um, which is the only oil that Bahrain's ever found, of course, uh, <coughs> despite being the most active oil company historically, it didn't find any oil. It was a great irony, of course. Um, but they came up with a solution which saw the boundary go up here, and therefore the shoal uh, belonged to Saudi Arabia, but they agreed to split the, uh, the profits from it uh, in perpetuity. Um, it's never produced much more than 120,000 barrels per day. And since the causeway, causeway was built between the two sides, Saudi Arabia has let Bahrain keep all the uh, income from that particular oil field. Uh, so a joint economic zone, not a joint sovereign zone. But here, down here, we've got one of the... the this is something I'll come back to later. But we have an incredibly strange <coughs> position here where we have a boundary... Uh, there's a long history to it, but I won't get into that. <coughs> we have a, a land boundary in Qatar and Saudi Arabia to a terminal point here, and it becomes the maritime <coughs> boundary between Qatar and the UAE. Uh, I don't think you can see that, say, the, say, see that anywhere else in the world, where you've got a, uh, a land boundary terminating, a land rules the sea, and then you've got a boundary with someone else, uh, the Qatar and Abu Dhabi boundary of 1969. And so there's a, there's a whole series of issues that have still to be resolved south of here. Um, but what they did here was stretch what was basically an equidistance line to deliberately coincide with the, exist, with the location of an oil field. So the two sides had to share it. Uh, because otherwise, if they'd used a true one, it, it would have laid just to, uh, to the, into the maritime space of one state to the exclusion of the other. 
So another device which has been used elsewhere, like the Joint Economic Zone. So the, 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 the Gulf has been a bit of a guinea pig for state practice. And even if we go back to Abu Musa and we look at the Memorandum of Understanding of 1971, which was concluded between Sharjah and Iran um, before the UAE was proclaimed, um, again, you could say that was a nonsense of an agreement in some ways, but it, it was pragmatic. Um, if you read the preamble to that agreement in uh, MO, uh, the 1971 agreement, it basically says that Iran and Sharjah both um, exercise full sovereignty over the whole of the island and recognize the other's claim. So it was a bit of a nonsense. Each side maintains full sovereignty over the whole island, and then they agree physically to divide it, with the north being allowed quite explicitly in the agreement to be developed as a military area by Iran. Um, but the, also there was a, a little oil field um, I went over it in a helicopter a couple of decades back with Jeremy Carver, actually, and uh, called the Mubarak oil field. And it used to produce about 9,000 barrels per day. But again, uh, the proceeds from that oil field were shared between Iran and Sharjah until it ran out of oil uh, a decade or so ago, <coughs> a decade and a half ago, I would have thought now. So again, uh, an agreement which in sovereignty terms was nonsense, was a nonsense, really. Uh, but which introduced a sort of condominium, but which was pragmatic and was suited to the realities of the day when Iran was seen as the West's biggest friend, certainly the US's biggest friend, and they wanted Iran to be the chief policeman for security in the area. So uh, it wasn't a bad agreement, and it survives today, of course. The 1971 MOU does still survive, and whatever you hear about Abu Musa, <coughs> there hasn't been that much infraction of Iran uh, on the southern part of the island, they've extended their airstrip and whatever. But quite ap soon after the incidents of 1992, the ferry was going as normal between Sharjah and, uh, and, and Abu Musa Island. So there was a lot of fuss about it in the media, but at a local level, uh, life went back to reasonably normal conditions uh, there. Uh, I mean, obviously the situation changed in 71 when Iran was allowed to develop the north as a military zone. Uh, let's move on to the Northern Gulf. Um, what headlines have I written here? Let's have a look. Massive economic states investment must presuppose transboundary cooperation. Understandable Kuwaiti nervousness as Iraq returns to its region, given troubled historical <coughs> relationship. Current boundaries limitation and demarcation unusual. Old access, uh, issues of access and communication, communication loom. What about a symbolic joint port at Onkasa? Um, let's remind ourselves of this UN award um, and uh, the sort of state of the map here. Um, um, most of you will know this region, so I don't really need to say too much. The copy of the map is a little blurred as well. But I suppose in practical terms, one of the interesting aspects of the UN Award of 1993, and we've got Morris Mendelssohn here who's written about it quite a bit, um, was that it decided that this bit, the Khor Abdullah, was territorial sea and therefore was subject to a median line boundary along the, the whole of that waterway. It means that uh, Iraq's great uh, navigation <coughs> channel which were dredged from the mid-1960s to the port of Omkasa, <coughs> for the most part lie in Kuwaiti territorial waters. It means, obviously, uh, Iraq has a right of innocent passage, uh, and it has a right of usage uh, of the main navigational channels in Kuwaiti territorial sea. What it doesn't have is a right to dredge and maintain those channels. Um, luckily, or well, unluckily for the people who used to run Iraq, uh, luckily for Iraq today, I suppose, the uh, Britain and the, the rest of the, the, the powers who invaded in uh, 2003 did dredge the, channel, uh, the channels and the approaches down to a decent level, did clear them of uh, various bits of, of wreckage. So um, 
But <laughs> I suppose one of the, the problems, uh, if we think about Rumela, which is up here, Rumela was proven to be a transboundary oil field uh, by the UN survey, the first survey of both sides of the boundary. Uh, Rumela oil field, the southern tip is called Rukka, uh, or uh, it's, it's, it's close to it in, in the northern bit of Kuwait. Obviously, it was announced probably about five years ago that there were uh, 36, there's going to be $36 billion worth of investment in Romela alone by both BP, with BP, BP, the National Chinese Oil Company, and the Iraqi National Oil Company. And the idea was to get production up there up to 2.8 million barrels per day from that field. Already they've got it up to about 1.4, 1.5 million barrels per day. But they've recently downsized their expectations of how much Iraq's big oil fields, the big five, can produce. So um, we've recently downsized from made it down to 2.1 million. They think it can produce. Um, uh, Zubair has been downsized from 1.2 million down to about 850,000 barrels. Uh, Kona 1 uh, down again to uh, about uh, the, the whole of uh, the, those oil fields, the, the estimates have been downsized. Nonetheless, um, there is a need for much better access, uh, and navi navigational access, and access across the land boundary to develop some of these southern fields. And I know it's been exercising, or it was a few years ago, BP, for instance, where where were they going to get the water from to sort of flush out some of the wells in Rumela? Which bits of water might they reuse here? Uh, and uh, <coughs> so um, I don't know if those decisions have uh, come forward in any way. Um, but looking at it from the Kuwaiti side, of course, um, the Iraqi occupation wasn't that long ago. And uh, there have been some problems at the boundary itself, at uh, Um Qasir itself. I think back in 2005, the Iraqis got upset by the sort of uh, erection of a metal barrier at Um Qasir, uh, <coughs> which uh, prevented local movement. Um, so a number of issues that need to be <coughs> looked at there. Um, <coughs> I'm presuming most people would be able to guess where that is. Or um, a few of you would be. It's one of the few areas in the world where you can go onto a pier in one country and go along the pier, and at the end of the pier be in another country. Blackpool. Blackpool, <laughs> if only. <laughs> yeah. Khor al Khor No, it's it's actually on Casa. Oh. So um, the the the. the coastline of the baseline is in Kuwait, and uh, two pretty useless, disused old uh, piers here are, are actually in the waters of Iraq. Um, now there was some use being made of these piers <coughs> by the Iraqis in, in about 10 years ago, or whatever, but not much, not much. But it, it, it's an anomaly to have that sort of thing. Uh, it's a nice little quiz question. Gosh, Charles mentioned that I talk about the Chapelain, what I've been doing for a while. <laughs> uh, again, I won't look at the history too much, other than to say that over 130 years it moved from being a totally Ottoman river uh, to a predominantly Iraqi river, to being shared along the main navigable channel, as, you, as you're supposed to do for navigable rivers, along the Talve according to the 1975 agreement that was signed between Iran and Iraq. Um, and that wasn't just, there was a, a declaration in principle in March 1975, remember the Algiers Accord, where we had Saddam Hussein and Boumediene in the middle and the Shah of Iran next to him, some famous photos there, where basically the Shah of Iran said, well, we'll stop supporting the Kurdish rebellion in the north, but the price we want is that river. We want it to be a, uh, we want it to be shared, as it should be. And I think everyone at the time underestimated just what a big question this became for the Shah of Iran. It was a huge thing. 
invested an awful amount of his own reputation and legitimacy on getting this boundary back. Uh, we all know what happened four or five years later. Um, uh, well, five years later, Saddam Hussein himself, now president, tore up the treaty in front of an impassioned TV audience and said he'd been looking forward to doing it ever since the day he'd signed it. And, of course, then Iraq invaded uh, Iran uh, quite soon after <coughs> that. Um, <coughs> we, at the end of that, well, it's still not been formally ended, has it, the Iran-Iraq war, but at the end of hostilities, uh, there was a correspondence between Raf Sanjani and Hussein, which hinted at an, Iranian, uh, at an Iraqi willingness to recognize the 1975 treaty uh, agreement again although the, the view is out about the degree to which Iraq did form, reformalize uh, its agreement to, to those arrangements. Um, but where are we today with this thing? Um, well, we're probably edging towards a situation where the two sides are in agreement that we go back to the 1975 boundary in most respects, but it's a question of which line uh, introduced by the 1975 boundary. Where the mouth, the 1975 boundary defines a land boundary, but it begins at the point where the feature is, is seen to uh, actually start in Gulf waters themselves. So there's a fixed terminal point, if you like, of the, um, of, of the uh, boundary. Territorial waters below have never been agreed. So Everything to this one to this side of the boundary is Iranian internal waters, or so that is Iran's claims, and therefore there isn't a matchup between territorial waters on the Iraqi side here with Iraqi territorial waters and the boundary of Kuwait a few miles that way. So there's a mismatch. <coughs> but obviously, what's happened as well is that, and a few Iraqis have complained about this. They said nature's been very unkind to it and very unfair because all the movement in the river, because rivers do move, has been to the south and to the west. So that was the line of the 1975 boundary, and this is the line as a navigation channel today. So obviously Iraq is saying, well, if we go back to 75, of what I hear of, of, of what consultations there have been, we'd like it to go back to that line. Uh, whereas the Iranians are saying, don't be down, let's have it where it is. Now, there were a number of incidents where Iran detained British sailors, famously in 2004 and 2007. And as a result of the 2004, the earlier uh, taking of uh, the British sailors in a dinghy, who were apprehended, apprehended somewhere probably about there, um, and you can remember they were blindfolded uh, on TV, as a result of that, Iraq, which was then occupied, uh, uh, Britain, uh, the United States, and Iran agreed that the current navigable channel could, would be regarded <laughs> as the operative boundary. So that happened in about 2004, 2005. Then we had the incidents of 2007. Um, and again, you'll remember those. This is a map produced by our colleagues up at the International Boundaries Research Unit. Uh, positions two and three say where the Iranians thought they had apprehended the, uh, the sailors. <coughs> uh, number one is where Britain said it did. Um, and uh, there were problems with all of these things. First of all, it took about two or three days, and then the British, uh, the Prime Minister's office, or the Cabinet office, said that they had been apprehended in Iraqi territorial waters. Well, of course, Iraqi territorial waters had never been defined at this point. You had the, the land boundary down to there, but after that, you didn't have any territorial waters. So if there had been a territorial water boundary, yes, it probably would have been on the Iraqi side, but it was actually south of the point where the boundary ended. So you couldn't really say that with any clarity. Neither could the Iranians say with any, for the same reason. Yeah. The, the, <coughs> so uh, there was a... A map produced by the Cabinet Office, which I didn't uh, include here, <coughs> which actually showed a continuity between the agreed <coughs> land boundary here and the median line, the notional median line, 
which is a bit naughty, because this isn't an agreed boundary. It's just a median line. Uh, so, um, and, ag and, and again, uh, Ibru reckoned at least that the point where Britain said it happened was also on a bit of a lee shore. So, it, you know, uh, the thing would have been beached if it, if it had actually been uh, uh, where, where they said it was. So no one covered themselves with glory in that episode. And I said funny things have been happening with maps. This is one of the first ones uh, where, you know, states are actually wanting to portray more clarity than there actually is. The clarity just wasn't there to make those charges. Um, this is worthy of comment as well. Um, someone, <coughs> some might remember that during the summer of 2000, we had two seemingly intractable boundary disputes in the region, covered by treaties in two months. We had Yemen and Saudi Arabia in June 2000, and then we had Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. They, did, they, they divided the old neutral zone here, offshore. In July 2000, two processes which had just seemingly, seemingly unendingly never promised to deliver results before this time. And what, was, what were the prompts? Well, the, the then Crown Prince, now King Abdullah, basically uh, saw a window of political opportunity. He took responsibility for things, particularly on the Yemen agreement. And they he said, go and sign the agreements. You know, we, we can join the dots later, if you like. So Yemen and Saudi Arabia signed the boundary agreement, which was incredibly short on detail, with very, very few uh, points. Uh, uh, and they said, well, fill the detail in later. It's important we have the user's political window to sign the agreement. This one was also uh, prompted because in May of 2000, Iran announced that it was going to start exploring the Dora gas field here. Um, so what did the agreement do in July 2000? It was quite interesting, because the previous to J July 2000, there were two little islands here, Karu and Umar Muradin, um, which were disputed, at least in partial sovereignty, between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Um, they sought a that <coughs> out, um, but they drew a boundary to, from the line which partitioned the old neutral zone on land here, and it just went out to the middle of the Gulf. They couldn't say where to, because Iran and Kuwait had never signed a boundary here. But they also said that just like the old uh, neutral zone, the economic arrangements which were in place on land would continue out at sea. So within a zone, and they gave coordinates in the south and coordinates to the north, for this old neutral zone, there would be a joint economic zone in which everything would be shared <coughs> in this area. Interestingly, what they also said would be that the negotiation of an eastern boundary for this whole block, north and south of this line, would be the joint responsibility of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So you also had almost a national security component built into the agreement, uh, whereby, you know, Kuwait wasn't left alone in trying to defend claims over Dora here. Having said that, Kuwait and uh, uh, Iran, uh, Kuwait's uh, advised by the UK Law of the Sea Division uh, and various others, um, they have had on and off intermittent talks. Uh, keep saying that a, a, a boundary here is going to be imminent uh, <coughs> between Iran and Kuwait. Uh, it hasn't hasn't happened. Talks and statements are made every so occasionally by both the Iranians and the Kuwaitis saying expect some progress. But there hasn't been much. There was an agreement initial back in 1968, uh, but uh, historically there's been a, a 10 mile or so overlap of claims in this region. And then of course there's matching up. I've men already mentioned Iran and Iraq haven't defined their territorial waters, uh, haven't defined their their short uh, maritime boundary, so there'd be a match up there, and there'd be a match up to the Saudi boundary to the south, uh, which will be quite difficult because they each, um, they each recognize islands as having different effects and everything. So th th there's, there's messy bits uh, at either end of, of lines there. Um, and at the moment, there's no great urgency in those uh, 
talks between Iran and Kuwait. Nothing much is happening. Let's go on to something a bit more lighthearted. <laughs> <coughs> the, uh, there were, as, as many people will know here, when you go to court at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, you often write your arguments in memorials. You then exchange those memorials and get a chance to rubbish each other's arguments, if you like, uh, uh, and then it'll eventually go for court hearings. Um, now, this was the longest case between Bahrain and Qatar that's ever been before the International Court of Justice, and it was the only one to rule on sovereignty and to lay down a maritime boundary <coughs> at the same time, or one and the same time. Um, it had lots of episodes to it, a rather dull one at the beginning that lasted about at least three years on jurisdiction as to whether the uh, court had the jurisdiction to go ahead and try the dispute in the form submitted to it in July of 1991. Once the court did decide it could go ahead, um, you know, the sides produced their memorials and counter memorials, and then Bahrain pointed to the rather odd appearance of about 81 documents that were in its uh, memorial, and then another one which was in the counter memorial. And there are a mixture of maps and letters that didn't seem to chime with known history, if you like. And uh, what Qatar would have been very uh, uh, interested to see as to whether there was any agreement which may have, may have suggested that the Hawar Islands here actually belonged to Qatar or to the Ottoman Empire, maybe, during the late 19th century. And you wouldn't find anything in the known historical record to suggest that. The, the, you know, the findings would be the opposite, probably. But what they came <coughs> up with was this agreement which purported to show a boundary between being agreed between Britain and the Ottoman Empire at some time, 1868. Um, but there were a few things that <coughs> maybe we didn't need to look too hard at at the Peace Palace to realize they didn't sound quite right. Um, for a start, they'd have probably been written in, in French, and you know, the only boundary agreement between Britain and the Ottoman Empire was the Yemen boundary in 1903 and 1905, and it was tremendously ornate and uh, well <coughs> presented, and et cetera, et cetera. But the British ambassador apparently gave his um, blessing to this agreement by writing, okay, <laughs> uh, 1868. Didn't really come into popular <coughs> parlance until the 20th century, and then it was in America. So, uh, yeah, there are a few things that seemed a bit dashed. Uh, there was uh, raffle tickets, there was Anatolian fair stamps. Uh, no one knew quite where they were coming from. Of course, Qatar could say there's a legitimate trade in former Ottoman documents. We bought these in good faith. Uh, maybe uh, they weren't that uh, convincing. In the end, uh, Qatar asked the court to disregard these for evidentiary purposes. It didn't withdraw them. It asked the court to disregard them for evidentiary purposes. There was no mention of this <coughs> in the final judgment, of course. Um, and, uh, but I suppose you could say that Bahrain did rather better than Qatar in most respects in that judgment. We were as we were because the evidence was the same as when Britain looked at these questions in the 30s and the 40s. It didn't really change. Um, although people may have opinions on that. But um, we haven't seen such a brazen attempt, if you like, to include these sort of documents, probably in since, uh, you know, Alaska and, and the Aleutian Islands went to uh, America with the uh, agreements at uh, around the same time, actually, 1867, 1868. So um, I suppose on the Central Gulf there's another one. Um, the only thing would be to, if we mentioned uh, Iran and Qatar, uh, I, I suppose um, there really isn't a, an agreement, there isn't much disagreement over the boundary. Uh, the boundaries <coughs> that were put in place between Iran and Qatar and, and, and Iran and Bahrain uh, in the 1969-1970 period, well there's a question mark as to where the terminal point is here. A technical question there. Obviously, Qatar's um, uh, 
maybe greater use, shall we say, of the North Dome than Iran has of the South Pass field. Um, but I think in the last half decade or so, you know, mainly possibly as a sop to keep Iran reasonably, uh, reasonably happy, Qatar hasn't. There's been no new developments on the on the North Dome field for some time. Um, I mean, obviously, they haven't slowed down those that there are, but there haven't been any really big new, new things happening there. Further down. <coughs> uh, what do I say about the 74 Saudi UAE border treaty? A bizarre treaty by any terms on land and sea. The already complex picture gets even more complex. There was a Qatar Saudi boundary treaty and a three mile Saudi navigational corridor. Non sovereign was actually introduced by a 2008 treaty just above the maritime line that we showed earlier. Um, let's uh, explain what I mean there. The 1974 boundary treaty <coughs> introduced this sort of line here um, between the UAE, uh, what is Abu Dhabi negotiated actually in 74, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. And what happened, what was the basic deal? It's always said that the basic deal was Saudi Arabia dropped any residual it claims it had in Al Ain, Bahrain, <coughs> that region, and in return got official formal recognition from the UAE that the Khor al-Adaid here actually belonged to <coughs> Saudi Arabia. Previously, Britain had always recognized the claims of the Abu Dhabi to, to the area around this water inlet. So in practical terms, the effect of a 74 treaty was to give Saudi Arabia a, a sovereign access corridor through the Khor al-Adaid here. And that, and Therefore, the territories of Qatar and the UAE did not meet on land. Nonetheless, it, you still had the continuity of the maritime boundary between Qatar and Abu Dhabi up here. So you had apparently a Saudi uh, uh, sort of land corridor with no outlet to the sea beyond the territorial water belt. The other thing it did was deal with a, uh, a field called Zarara, here, uh, Sheba is called on the Saudi side, Zarara on the uh, UAE side. Uh, but no one was quite sure what the, the boundary had introduced the treaty for, for a couple of decades, and then it was made more public, uh, and its content was known. And people were surprised to read what the two sides had actually agreed up to. Uh, the Zarara Sheba field explicitly, the agreement says that uh, even the third of the oil field that lies in the UAE, Sheba, actually belongs in full rights, in sovereign terms, to the Saudi Arabia. And that Saudi Arabia has rights to all of that oil field. And the only thing, in fact, it has to consult with the UAE about is if it, if it actually exploits from <coughs> the northern side of the oil field is the route by which it will get it to the coast. Uh, so, um, so a very unusual agreement, also very unusual its specification here. Only one of the islands was specified to belong to Saudi Arabia. I think it was Makassar, I can't remember. Um, the rest of the islands were recognized as belonging to the UAE, but Saudi Arabia was allowed to erect any installations it may wish on them. So again, rather a strange prescription. The whole of the area around here was specified as a sort of neutral zone until such time as they signed a final agreement between them. They've never done that in the period since. Uh, when Fahad died and Zayed died in the mid noughties there was a return to the table where the Saudis say that, uh, particularly Hamdan in the uh, UAE uh, foreign, in the UAE government, was too insistent that the, uh, the uh, 
the regulations covering Shaber and the regulations covering the Hurla Day be revised in some way. And they broke off uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then you had, as I say, a slight uh, uneasiness, build up of tensions, and you had a little naval incident in here in March 2010. Um, so position's very unclear here. Um, one or two lawyers have, uh, have said, uh, I've been approached by the United Arab Emirates to try and see if they can't make some sort of argument that the 74 agreement was signed under duress, uh, because uh, that's the only argument I think you could probably use to try and say that uh, the treaty shouldn't apply. I don't think there's any uh, convincing evidence for that. I think the archival evidence that's been released by the uh, uh, in, in the Foreign Office files suggests that neither side was terribly careful about what it signed at the time. In fact, there was a, a quite an outspoken <coughs> Saudi uh, ambassador who was here in the early 70s, a guy called Halisi, and he actually said, why have we signed this agreement? It's ridiculous. You know, it, it makes absolutely no sense. <coughs> but I think to, to look at why it happened, I think you have to look further back to, to when Britain really tried to push for a, for a sort of boundary agreement in this area at the turn of the 70s. And it does seem as though early in that year at an Islamic summit in Lahore, um, uh, the position on the Durara Sheba field actually, actually changed. It, it appears that the Saudis said, OK, you can have a bit more territory uh, than we were going to give you, uh, uh, for you, Abu Dhabi but we're not relinquishing our all rights in the area. So uh, that's why you ended up with that rather weird regulation whereby an oil field that goes into a neighbor's territory can actually be um, uh, enjoyed by another state, not that Saudi Arabia has shown any inclination to actually uh, use that. Nonetheless, Shaper, there are plans that that should be up to one million barrels per day production quite soon, so it's, it's a significant oil find. And of course, against all this, um, the um, United Arab Emirates has become much, much more confident vis-a-vis -vis its neighbours. And as, almost as if to show this, that there's a couple of maps that appeared in um, the UAE yearbook uh, in the mid-noughties. And they were quite interesting because the Coral Adade appears to be back part of the UAE. And it appears so does the whole of the oilfield seems to be pretty much part of the UAE. And of course the islands to the north are part of the UAE. So it sort of symbolized the regional, if you like, confidence of the UAE as it gets more powerful vis-a-vis -vis to its other states. But uh, when the Saudis said, uh, what exactly do you mean by this map? They said, well, it's, we know it's not the legal boundary. You know, we know what the legal truth is. It's not a legal map, but it is showing a territory for the UAE which is uh, based upon, which is correct from a historical and cultural point of view. Yeah. So it was fishing a bit. It was fishing. It's not a legal boundary, but it, nonetheless, it's the correct boundary. And again, trying to muddy the waters, waters with maps. We've seen some maps here today where there hasn't been enough clarity uh, to make these statements that Iran and uh, Britain wanted to make in the northern Gulf. This is where one of the sides wanted to introduce some murkiness, if you like. So, um, uh, so, so quite different there. So um, that's pretty much rounded off what I wanted to say. I, mean, I, I suppose in conclusion, um, the challenges that sort of face the state um, relate to existing boundary agreements being rather inadequate from a technical point of view. Um, and then we have the areas of the map, if you like, uh, where the situation sort of inherited from the time Britain was there has simply been too messy for the sides to resolve. And I think that particularly between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they've got a really messy inheritance. And it's quite unclear as to how they're ultimately going to deal with it. Let me just show you where that corridor is as a last thing. Yeah, by that 2008 agreement, Saudi Arabia and Qatar agreed for a non-sovereign corridor uh, to go just above that 1969 maritime boundary. 
so that there could be a navigational access channel for the sea. I don't know if people know the state of the <coughs> geology and waters around here, but it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to actually uh, put a navigation channel down there. It's all very diffi difficult rock <coughs> condition. You almost have to blast it with, well, very, very powerful uh, devices. Um, uh, I think there was one famous British quote, or what one guy in the British government said, the practical uselessness of this territory, I, we just, just hasn't sunk in with the Saudis. You know. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be very expensive to build it. So mainly technical, practical challenges, not in an overriding atmosphere of conflict or threat at the moment, uh, but interesting ones nonetheless. 